uh, back in studio, we continue on with the day's conversations. And this morning, we are taking the direction of the women's contribution in ending HIV by 2030. It's a conversation that we had seven days ago here. And my panel was men. Today, I'm privileged to have women on the same dialogue. But in Uganda, HIV AIDS has been approached as more than a health issue. And in 1992, a multi-sector AIDS control approach was adopted. Now, to that further, Uganda's efforts in establishing a comprehensive HIV and AIDS program in 2000, the Ministry of Health implemented birth practices and self-infantry feeding counseling. According to the UN statistics right now, HIV continues to affect almost 570 Ugandan girls and women aged between 15 and 24, and those statistics are per week. Imagine that 570 women be aged between 15 and 24 per week. As if that's not enough, this extends the concern on the fight against HIV, especially if we are to meet that national development planning target of 2030 and how women are actually contributing to their own side of this success story. This morning, I'm privileged to be hosting Madame Lilian Moreco, who's the Executive Director, International Community of Women Living with with HIV. Good morning to you. Good morning uh, to you and uh, to all our viewers. You're most welcome. Thank you. Next to her, we do have a young lady who is going to be giving us the perspective to this conversation. Her name is Ruth Akulu. She is an HIV prevention advocate still with the International Community of Women Living with HIV. Good morning to you, Ruth. Good morning. How are you? Very good. It's a pleasure to have you in studios with us. Now, um, let me first turn to the executive director. Tell us more about the international community of women living with HIV. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the international community of women living with HIV is uh, a global network of women uh, living with HIV. And uh, we are operating globally. But uh, here we are talking about uh, ICW Eastern Africa, which is operating in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. And uh, we are an advocacy organization for and by women living with HIV. And uh, our work rotates around ensuring that uh, women in all their diversity have access to prevention, care, treatment, and support services. So we care more about sexual reproductive health and rights, as uh, it is very key in terms of HIV. But we also work around human rights, ensuring that all women living with HIV and women in their diversity have access to full rights. Okay, and when we look at the prevalence of HIV among women, what's the situation and status for us here in Uganda, uh, looking at the national level and regional level? So as uh, we speak globally, regionally, but also countrywide, women are bearing the burden of the epidemic. So we are talking about over 50% of all people living with HIV uh, being women. But like you rightly said, in Uganda, for example, we are talking about an epidemic that has a female face, but not only a female face, but a young female face. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about young women and girls newly getting infected at a highest rate that you can think about. So 570 women, young women getting infected every week is to the extreme. And so that can tell what we are talking about. And of course, when you talk about HIV, you're not only talking about the infections, but you're also talking about the burden, who bears the burden of the epidemic. So you find that it is women and girls, because we are talking about caring. We are talking about mother to child transmission. And therefore, in a situation where you have children getting infected, young people, the burden of care is on women and girls. And that's why it is important that we should talk about women in the response and that we should actually not only talk about women in the response but also recognize their effort that for 40 years the burden of the response has been on women and girls. Okay. Well, the other day I was having a conversation with uh, nurses, as I mean, nurses, and the way they were so expressive about their job, they made me want to become a nurse. And then the gentleman among them said, no, but you're a nurse. I said, how? By virtue of the fact that you're a woman, you're a nurse, you're a natural, you take care of. And so that, that's definitely yeah, uh, bringing exactly. to perspective the burden that you talk about. But Ruth here is the young lady uh, the, that we want to talk to directly. Um, in 
terms of your own experience and the experience of young women that you have engaged with in your advocacy work, uh, what do you think has led us to have such statistics, first of all, and the, ad, you know, the response in regards to the available alternatives to dealing with this uh, epidemic? Yes, um, since today we are talking about women contributing to ending HIV and uh, we have to recognize that women, women um, give birth to a nation. So um, from a young age, women are always empowered um, culturally to be submissive, which is not a bad thing, but again, um, most women are taken advantage of by men and when, especially when it comes to um, sexual when when it comes to bargaining for a safe sex and this is one of the things that is leading to the new hiv infections among young women mm -hmm. so right now if you uh, I, I i know this is not this is not uh, something that is new but uh, we've we've we are right now everywhere we keep hearing about sugar daddies and also sugar babies so if you if you are dating if imagine a 20 year old dating a 40 year old so that kind that girl is not able to to be able to negotiate for let me say the use of condoms because uh, in most cases uh, during the sexual act they will be asked why do we have to why mm. do we have to use the condom so so and this also points us to the gender inequality in that kind of a relationship the other thing that is fueling stigma right now we have uh, right now there is uh, we still have um, stigma and discrimination and this and this is related to hiv aids we have the new hiv we have hiv prevention tools like prep pay but again in the in the the way how they've been packaged they look like the arvs mm -hmm. so for anyone who is to access those services someone else who doesn't know they may think that they're actually taking ARVs and they might be subjected to stigma and discrimination and most women most women w wouldn't want to go through that especially uh, the women that are, exp are experiencing intimate partner violence so in uh, Rakai the the female sex workers also uh, gave us evidence on why they wouldn't really want to access these services and yet they are highly effective in preventing HIV infection mm -hmm. because of the stigma that is fueled by the community all the societal norms and uh, and uh, and yes societal norms and understanding towards HIV okay yes. all right uh, coming back to you miss uh, Moreco in terms of the organization it facilitates five countries within the region here in East Africa I believe it has funding from different donors you know and so for the different projects that have been implemented within the region you get to see that perhaps things are okay for your side but let's look at the spectrum here in Uganda <laughs> most recently uh, DGF closure has definitely affected NGOs that participate in the advocacy uh, mm -hmm. for HIV coming to an end in 2013 you do have cutting of funding the economic strain on those living with and those that are bearing the burden with those that are living with and this begs the question is this dream really realistic mm -hmm. 2030 dealing away with HIV in Uganda yeah uh, thank you very much uh, you put it very right the situation for civil society for any for NGOs for organizations that are working on health organizations that are working on HIV and any other organization that is working uh, that is private and not public is having a challenge in terms of resources and funding and uh, for our organization it is not different even when we are a regional organization we are not different from any other organization mm -hmm. so we are also faced with those challenges of funding uh, resources to make sure that uh, we sustain the organizations but also to make sure that the work that we are doing is able to reach everywhere where we are supposed to reach and therefore it is the biggest challenge that uh, we are all faced with and uh, of course it is a challenge to the response and uh, globally it is very clear and known and uh, so as a country that if we don't get more resources and funding, we may not be able to reach the goal of ending AIDS by 2030. And therefore, UN AIDS and partners like Global Fund, like PEPFAR, 
like governments are also working hard to make sure that uh, we get sustainable funding and resources to enable us to reach that goal because it is very very important that we end AIDS uh, by 2030 uh, and so that is one of the key areas or gaps that we see in terms of uh, what would what may limit us accessing uh, or reaching the goal mm. but it is also important to talk about other issues mm -hmm. that uh, may not enable us reach the goal of ending AIDS by 2030 and uh, like probably most people know that the legal environment we are operating under is really unfavorable there's a lot of human rights violations to the extent that if you talk about young women and girls, you talk about young people, if you talk about care and vulnerable populations that now we even fear to talk about because of the anti-homosexuality act that has been passed, then that means that we are limiting access to services by the groups that should be accessing services and therefore enabling us to reduce new infections and uh, therefore end AIDS by 2030. But it is also important to factor in the point that uh, Ruth has talked about stigma and discrimination and like you rightly said we are talking about 570 young people young women and girls getting infected every week the level of stigma that young people face mm -hmm. is extremely high that they may not be that courageous and strong to come out and say let me go and test for HIV when I'm HIV positive let me take my treatment and when they start on treatment, they may not continue on treatment because they are institutions of learning, they are in schools where stigma is very high, where they, you know, like they, they are mingling or mixing with others, but they are not so sure the level to which they are going to be stigmatized and okay. discriminated. All right, but yeah. on the positive side, there's been so many innovations and technologies that have come up to actually aid this becoming a reality under the National Development Plan 3. And so let's look at the treatments. Um, there's now the single drug, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming through. You do have the test self-testing kit that has been released to the Ugandan market. I believe that's a positive in this direction. How crucial are these new innovations, Ruth, in actually aiding towards this objective of 2030? Uh, thanks for highlighting those interventions. Uh, we have, yes, we have the HIV self-testing kits, whereby it's very convenient for any person, even a young person, to go and access, because they, they are distributed across the country. In every health facility, at least there is um, an HIV self-testing kit you can get to be able to test for your HIV, because it contributes to the first 95 in our uh, in being aware of your HIV status. So so if I ask you now, do you know your HIV status? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is a very important question yeah. that we need to to answer and through and in the way how we can we are able to answer that question is through testing. But again we do not stop there. We have um, new HIV prevention tools that are now coming on board. We started with PEP which is um, which which uh, which is the post pre prophylaxis as um, post exposure pre yes it's pre, pre uh, oh okay you take it before no you take it after you're uh, being exposed for mm -hmm. a period of 28 days mm -hmm. and you take it within the 72 hours and then we have the prep and now it is coming in many forms we first had the the oral prep which is taken on a daily basis to prevent HIV infection. And uh, it is highly effective. It has a um, 95% efficacy rate, which means that there are high chances for you to be able to prevent HIV infection once it's used correctly as prescribed by a health worker. And then we have now, we have the, 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 the Pivin Vaginal Ring, which has been uh, approved by World Health Organization for women that is now targeting the women. Today we are talking about women. So be because of the new HIV infection rate among women, so it, there was a need for a female controlled HIV prevention tool to be able to prevent the infection. So we have the Depriven ring, which is inserted through the vagina to prevent, inve in, uh, to prevent infection through sexual intercourse. Now we also have the injectable PrEP, which will be administered through the buttocks. Um, 
every two months. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, a variety of new HIV prevention options that are coming on board. I'm talking about now the new HIV prevents, the new, the new, sorry, the, the teen pregnancies or the unintended pregnancies among women. If you ask a young woman, um, if you ask a young woman today, what would you be able to prevent? Or what, will, what are you highly to prevent? They would say pregnancy. So we have tools that are actually now um, are being developed to prevent both unintended pregnancy mm -hmm. and also uh, HIV infection. So that, if, well, so that whenever you go to a health facility to, call, to access a contraceptive tool, you are, uh, it comes with a package of that. All right. So Ruth has done a good job in advocating for <laughs> the good, safe, and attractive options that uh, people do have on the market to prevent themselves from getting HIV AIDS, and even those who do have AIDS, uh, to actually f have fulfilling lives thereof. Uh, bringing this conversation to conclusion, um, Madam Executive Director, what's the way forward? What's the call to action for women to engage in this fight against HIV by 2030? So thank you very much, and um, this is a long conversation, but uh, it is important to one, to know that uh, we must work together, we must engage women and girls, and uh, we must recognize the role that women and girls, particularly those living with HIV, have played in bringing us to where we are 40 years, that this response has been really on the shoulders of women. So as the international community of women living with HIV, our call to action is that we continue to implement a campaign that recognizes the efforts of women living with HIV for all this period that they have led us, that they have showed that the response, and that uh, we call upon young women and girls to join in this leadership, mm -hmm. in this uh, struggle, so that they are able to take up, to take over from where we have uh, reached. Okay. And as an organization, this year, on Thursday 8th, we shall be celebrating women all over the region, women living with HIV that have been really at the forefront, that have taken on leadership, that have advocated, that have really led and championed this cause. Okay. And we shall be celebrating mm -hmm. five women of them mm -hmm. from Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. And then we shall be mentoring and inspiring young women to join us. Thank and you very much. Everybody out there, yeah. join us on Thursday at Imperial Royale mm -hmm. from 5 p.m. We shall be live, we shall be live streaming, and uh, this program is going to be watched all over the world. Okay. So join us to celebrate women to champion the cause against ending AIDS by 2030. Thank you so much. That is International Community of Women Living with HIV and AIDS. But this is joint effort. Together, we can actually achieve this National Development Plan 3. This brings us to the end of this conversation. We take a short breather. Return shortly. <laughs>